Pastor Isaac leaned over and, and shouted over at me during worship. He says, I believe this is one of the great worship centers of all of Los Angeles. And I'd like to say to that, it has been for the last 60 years. Amen. A worship center, this whole corner, all five and a half acres of it, dedicated to the glory of God, dedicated to inviting people and families um, to get to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how many of you know that today, more than ever before, um, we need to make sure that we raise our families in God's ways? How many of you know that? It's so important. Give God a hand clap. Oh, how our society has missed the boat, if I can use the pun, shipwrecked. We've missed the boat when it's come to reaching our children for Jesus. We've missed the boat when adults come into uh, their own, so to speak, and forget that God has a purpose for them in their life. And it's not just to make millions or billions of dollars like Kate Spade. It's not about money. It ain't about fame. It ain't about fortune. And I got one thing to say to all the young people. Young people, don't be in a rush to grow up. Don't be in a rush to grow up, young people. Enjoy your youth while you have it. Enjoy your youth while you have it because when you get older, guess what? Hmm. You can't go back. I ran two and a half miles the other day with... Uh, the Carson Sheriff Station, and uh, it was it was uh, just a, a partial leg of a 6.8 mile run from the Carson Sheriff Station to Green Hills Cemetery in honor of the Special Olympics, and we were running on, on, and, um, in honor of Boomi's brother Akeen, who was a Special Olympian, suffered a heart attack three years ago, can't compete any longer, but um, he still is a Special Olympian. Amen. And, um, and, and um, I was reminded of my age. <laughs> uh, next year I'll be 40. <clears throat> <clears throat> but I've, I still feel young, you know what I'm saying? But young people, don't, don't rush to grow, to grow up. Don't rush to get old. Don't rush. You know, teenage boys want to rush and try to feel all big and grown and act grown. And, and young ladies want to try to rush and be grown. And, and, and I, I want to tell you what, only, the media has only caused that. But guess what? In our homes and in our families, we have to fight against that. And we have to remind our children that it's okay to be your age. My, my son, who's in middle school, a couple of weeks ago, he said, Dad, you think it's okay if I still like playing with toys? I said, absolutely. Play with toys as long as you want. One day when you, when you grow up, you're going to look back and say, oh, those were the days. But don't worry about it, mijo. The, 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 the longer God can protect you and, and cause your heart to be um, pure and innocent, the better. Amen? I ain't raising him to be no sissy. But I tell him he don't need to grow up faster than he needs to. Amen? You know, at home we say go to your room, but really it's not his room. It's not their room, is it? Teenagers these days have the nerve. My room. My phone, my TV, my bed, my clothes. Who bought all that? We did, didn't we? Your mom and dad. Don't get it twisted. Get it twisted. If I were to give today's message a title, I would call it Biblical Principles on Parenting, colon. Somebody say colon. And when your children ask you, tell them, dot, dot, dot. And when your children ask you, dot, dot, dot. There's a whole lot insinuated in that title. It insinuates that you're there. Number one, somebody say, I'm there. I'm there. Number two, it assumes that they're there. Say, somebody say, they're there. they're there. And number three... If I can inject a little bit of spirituality, how many of you know that God is there with us? Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap today. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Next week, we're going to have a message on fatherhood because it's Father's Day. This place better be packed out. 
Fathers, you better make sure all your kids are here. Make sure all the, the in-laws are here. Your grandchildren are here. Make sure everybody's here. Both sides of the family's here. Somebody say amen. amen. And then in the coming weeks, we need you all to pray with us. I'm going to say it so I can't weasel out of it. We're going to be speaking about divorce. We're going to be speaking about common law marriage. We're going to be speaking about why people don't get divorced and why they just move on and keep living with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and don't sign the papers and allow families to move on. We're going to be talking about these things. Somebody say, you crazy. <laughs> yeah, we are. Because we ain't afraid. And I know you're going to want to hear those messages. Because if here's a line, here's a line, we're going to be standing over here on this side. We're going to be standing on one side of the line. We're going to take a stance. Somebody said, too many preachers these days don't take a stance. Too many people don't preach the Bible, don't preach the word of God. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to be taking a stance. And... Uh, but, it, but that's only by, through fear and trembling, that we're going to do so. Not saying we have all the answers, but believing that by faith, God has given us some direction through his word. God has given us biblical direction for this world so that we can make the best decisions for our lives. Now, we can't do anything about our past. We can't do anything about what's already been done. But we sure can, can have an impact and have an influence on how we move forward. Somebody say amen. 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 This church is unique. This church is unique. It's a family church. A whole lot of families. A whole lot of relatives. We got, we got families in this church that have been divorced. And both sides, pre-divorce and after post-divorce, still come here. Because of the love. Because of this great community. We're going to stare that in the face, too. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to proffer some principles from the Bible that may assist us in how we should move forward. So that our children will not be confused. So that our children no longer have to feel that they're being torn and having to choose between one side of the family and the other. Can I hear an amen? amen. Man, I'm serious. So pray for us. Pray for us. So today, we're going to be preaching right back out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Something that was written about 4,000 years ago. It's a long time. I heard somebody say one time that the Bible was out of date. The Bible was out of touch. And had no business speaking to the world of today. I heard recently someone else said that GQ magazine, magazine, I sound like a Mexican right there, huh? <laughs> magazine. <laughs> I'm just a GQ Mexican, you know what I'm saying? No, but GQ magazine called the Bible a foolish book um, and was not worth reading. Did any of you guys read that, see that? Mm -hmm. That's right. But some of y'all, some of us got GQ, you know, you know, Latino GQ, you know what I mean? All the, oh, you know, you, I know what kind of magazines you got in the house. You know, it's all good. I ain't judging you. Just, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bad work. Take the good, leave the bad. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, if that's okay. Then I'm going to skip a few verses and I'm going to read the very beginning of verse 20. And the Bible says, somebody say, the Bible says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, hear, O Mission Ebenezer, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you 
and that you may increase. Somebody say increase. increase. Greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey. Somebody say milk and honey. Milk and honey. Just as the Lord, the God of your fathers promised you. Moses is telling the people of God, now you need to grow up, but you need to take care of of obeying the word of God so that you might prosper and you might live a blessed life and so that when you die, you don't have to worry about how your children are going to live or what happens to them because they're going to serve God just like you. And your children's children will also be blessed because of how we chose to obey God's word and live our lives according to it. Somebody say amen. So in verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Jesus repeated those words. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Somebody say today. today. Impress them upon your children. Underline that in your Bible. Highlight that if you have a highlighter or write it down in your MEFC journals. Impress them upon your children. Here we go, here we go. Talk about them when you sit at home. Somebody say, when you're at home. And when you walk along the road. Somebody say, when you're on the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. The Jews had a tradition where they would have the Ten Commandments written very, very, very small on, on paper, folded up, and they'd put it in a little, little leather pouch or box that stands off of their forehead with the leather strap that they tie at the back of their heads. And if you go to Jerusalem, you could see some people when they're going to pray or when they're going to synagogue, they're wearing these little leather straps with the word actually fastened to their foreheads. They take this verse right here, literally, literally. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Go to verse 20. This is awesome. And in the future, when your son asks you, dot, 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 in the future, when your daughters ask you, dot, dot, dot. In the future, when your grandchildren ask you, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I, I hear you, Mecca. Fill in the blank. Answer them. When they ask you, answer them. I was 16 and my dad came home from work. And he's a hardworking man. He still is to this day. He's here every morning at 6.30. Leads the crew. Leads this fine church. He says, Mio, how'd you like to go to Denver with me? I said, Dad, I'd love to. You're probably going to miss some, some sports, a little bit of school. It's okay, Dad. He said, I'd like for you to come with me. I'm going to be speaking at Promise Keepers at Mile High Stadium where the Denver Broncos play. I said, man, that sounds like fun. For a whole weekend, I peeked out from behind the curtains, this massive stadium, Mile High, where there were about 70,000 men. And watched my dad minister and lead men and preach the word of God. We even had a little fun. We wrote Promise Keepers 1996 on these tortillas. And he said, mijo, you have a good arm. Go over there and fling these tortillas into, the, in, into the, the audience. It was really, really cool. And I got a chance to meet a whole lot of other um, amazing men of God. Then a couple of years later, my dad pulled up in his Lincoln Town car. My brother David was at baseball practice. And he tooted the horn, and he said, can someone go and get David for me? And they came, and, and David came to the chain link fence at Carson High School. He says, yeah, Daddy. He says, mijo, grab your stuff. 
We're going somewhere. Where are we going? You're going with me to the Coliseum. Daddy's going to preach in front of 80,000 men. And I want you to come along. Oh, Dad, do I have to come? You have no choice in the matter. Grab your stuff. We're going. My brother spent a whole weekend with my father ministering to 80,000 men at the Promise Keepers gathering here. My dad was one of um, a handful of Latinos who were the face of the Promise Keepers, and they were African-American men. They were um, Anglo men, and, and there were Asian men that were, were coming together for racial reconciliation and for challenging men for a, a span of about 10 years to follow Jesus and to be the heads of households and to be the priests of their homes and to lead, lead their families to Jesus Christ. And my brother was there with my dad doing the same thing I did, talking with him in the car ride up the 110 freeway. They had wonderful conversations. And then in 1997, I was away at Gainesville, Florida, playing for the Gators. And I was right in the middle of fall baseball. And my dad called me and told me that he was taking Koba, my youngest brother, Pastor Koba, with him to the Washington, D.C. Million Man Gathering. Brother Francis Neros was there. A couple of other gentlemen from the church and others who are no longer here joined Pastor Isaac in speaking to 1.4 million men at the Mall of Washington, D.C. You can give God a hand clap right there. I believe Koba was about 14 years of age, but he looked like a 10-year-old because he was such a little shrimp all, almost all the way through high school. And Koba took his friend with him, Noel. And they had lots of co great conversations, and they splurged and, and opened up the little refrigerators at the hotels and ate up all the candies. And they ran up the bill right there for room service. But my dad didn't care because he wasn't concerned about a few dollars. His job was to raise men of God. I heard the story of a woman one day who yelled out of the back window, Honey, you and the boys are tearing up the grass. He says, honey, no offense. My job isn't to raise grass. It's to raise boys. Yeah. And the greatest conversation that I ever had with an adult all of my life as a child were not even necessarily with my father. Our relationship flourished as I came into adulthood. At the age of 18, I found myself not calling mom as much anymore. And you could look at the phone bill, and almost all the calls were to pops. But when I was a younger kid, the greatest conversations that I had were sitting in the passenger seat, most often riding shotgun with my mom. And she would ask us all kinds of questions. All kinds about girls. She'd ask us questions about our own sexual health. She would sit there and give you an hour-long lecture of, on abstinence and on waiting until marriage. She asked us all the, the dirty questions. She let pops off the hook. That's right. I remember my dad sweating beads one day when he says, uh, I heard he and my mom, over, you know, talking about who was going to give us the birds and the bees talk. And I just saw my dad sit me down at the edge of the, the, the bed. And I just saw the, he was just sweating bullets right there. He's like, uh, 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 uh so, uh, so, uh, like, dad, I already know everything you want to talk to me about. He's like, what? You're in second grade. <laughs> like, <laughs> kids are learning quick these days. Jesus, we I don't even know what I'm talking about. My wife came to me a couple of years ago. Elisha was in fourth grade. She said, I think you need to have the talk with your son already. I go, baby, I'm going to have the talk. But he knows everything I'm about to talk to him about. 
mijo, we're about to have a good talk. About what, dad? About the birds and the bees. How much do you know? <laughs> Quite a bit. Do you know this? Do you know, yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. Do you know that? Yeah. Wow, where'd you hear all this? At school, my friends. Praise God. As long as I was there to, to put that in check and to make sure, you know, he's learning the right stuff. Because we aren't going to raise our kids in a bubble. But we want to make sure, watch this, that the worldview that is being constructed in their, their beautiful and innocent little hearts and lives is being shaped by the word of God. And by the word of their mom and dad. So I'm thankful for the influence that my father had on our lives and, and the great influence, the quiet strength that my mother had. Just a, a constant, constant conversation with mama every day. Every day. They had to get it in, you know, before we got our license. Because once we got it, was like, see ya, you're out the door. Number one, there's a couple things I want to focus on today. Biblical principles on parenting, and when your children ask you, comma, tell them, dot, 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 proper grammar. The first thing that we need to be cognizant about is that we're physically present in our children's lives. Physically present in our children's lives. Number one. We have to be intentional about quality time. I never really understood quality time until my wife explained that to me because it wasn't one of my love languages. She had to teach me what quality time was because that was one of her love languages. And I go, oh, I still don't completely get it yet, but I'll learn. And so I'm learning what quality time. It didn't mean driving in the car with the kids on your way to something, trying to get a quick conversation in with my wife. That wasn't quality time. I thought it was. Quality time to her meant just me and her on a hot date. Me and her on the sofa at 8.30 after the kids already went to bed, having another one hour long conversation about how we're doing and where we're going and what God is doing in our lives. And we had to learn to apply that to our own children as well. We had to Make sure that for this generation, we can bring their eyes away from the gadgets and the, and the devices. And we, be, we have to be able to look our children in the eyes. And see what's going on in those eyes and what's going on behind those eyes. Even as young as, as six months we have to make sure to be able to speak to our children and praise them and talk to them and make sure that they're looking back to, at us. It's so important. And it's not just our children that we have to take their eyes away from the devices. It's making sure that we take our own eyes out of the devices or away from the television or away from whatever it is that's distracting us from giving them the time that they need. Deuteronomy said what? These are the commands, decrees, laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord. Verse 7, it says, impress them upon your children and talk to them when you sit at home. It means creating time to sit down with them and talk to them. Gadget free, television free. Toy free. Work free. And it doesn't just stop as they get older. Some of the most crucial conversations must be had with preteens and teenagers. How many school shootings have we had with teenagers? Barging into their own schools and shooting a whole bunch of their peers and colleagues. If only there was somebody who had sat down with them and looked them in the eyes and said, how are you doing? Do you know that I love you? Like my daddy used to always ask me and my brothers, Mio, you love Jesus? Yes, Dad. We must be present emotionally. 
We started off with physically, now emotionally. Our body language and the type of language that we use conveys our commitment to them, that we are present emotionally for them. When they're going through a tough time and they come home from school and they're bummed and you see it on their, their body because of how they're carrying themselves, you stop what you're doing. You turn off the, the phone. You get off that phone call. You pull the car over and you say, Miha, what's the matter, Miha? Sometimes they don't want to talk. Sometimes they're embarrassed to even bring bring it up, or even discuss what's going on in their little hearts. Do you need a little time? Can we talk about it in about 30 minutes when we get home? Okay. Do you need a little stuffed animal, a little friend to help you talk and play a little, little role play? Okay. Whatever it takes to get them to talk so that we can ask them more questions about what's going on in their little hearts. And that goes for our teenagers. You might not, you might not, you know, it might not be a little, a little teddy bear, but who knows, it might be a little blankie that you still can't let go, you know what I mean? Or it might be a little Starbucks, a little $4.99 Frappuccino that might just get them to open up and sing like a bird. Somebody say, whatever it takes. And I'm not saying these things so that you try and become their best friends. We ain't, we ain't trying to make best friends with our kids. I got plenty of friends. I got plenty of best friends, too. I don't need no more friends. I mean, I won't reject your friendship. On Facebook, either. I try and accept as many people, you know, on Facebook as possible, except half-naked ladies trying to ask me to be their friend. Bind you, devil. Rebuke you, Satan. But uh, as many people as I can influence with how I live my own life, and as many godly people can influence me, I'm, I'm, I'm good. So I, I don't mind more friends. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to make friends with my own kids. I'm their parent. I'm their father. But fathers must be as emotionally in tune with our children as much as the mothers. Man, you don't get a pass on this. I ain't good at that stuff. You know, I've never really been that good to be able to, you know, like tap into my emotion, you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? My dad never talked to me, man. I never learned to talk to them, man. All right, well, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. I'll take you to Burger King. I'll show you what I've learned. I wasn't good at it either. Took six sessions at marriage counseling to learn. Yeah, we went. What? I don't want to lose my marriage. My wife. I ain't too proud. I had to beg. I'm sorry. Thank God. 12 years later, Amen. we're here, three kids, faithful. Press, press them forward. We've been married for 15. But at year three, that was tough. Our children need to know that we, our hearts can be connected to theirs. Boom, 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 boom. We need to be there emotionally for them. We need to be patient, and we need to take the time that it, that it requires. And that will breed loyalty and trust and love. And one more thing, healthy children. Healthy children, God-fearing children, who one day will run through a brick wall with you because of the time that we took to spend with them to remind them of how much we love them, but more importantly, how much he loves them. We also must be there and be present intellectually 
for them. Intellectually. Somebody say intellectually. What do you mean, pastor? Shh. I didn't even get my high school degree. I'm not talking about that. This is what it means to be intellectual. That we're not afraid to ask or answer the tough questions. That if we have children who are thinkers, we have to be able to sit down with them and allow their questions to come this way. And we give them the best answers that we have or say, you know what, I'll come back to you on that one. And we also need to be able to ask the questions to them that gets them talking. And not just one word answers, but gets them to be able to share the things that they're thinking about. Trying to reconcile their faith in Jesus Christ and their commitment to the word of God. This ancient book with what the world of today is trying to teach them. That everything goes. That you only live once. That if it just makes you happy, do it. Man, that's a bunch of lies from the enemy. He softened everything to cause us and our children to believe in a facade. What's a facade? It's when you go to Disneyland and you see, you see that ride over there. And you're like, wow, it's so great. And then you go and you walk behind it and you see that it's all fake. It's just a wall with pretty colors, really cool images. Being there intellectually for them means that we can discuss ideologies that they're learning in other places. And then we, we might be able to lead them to good books and better influences. And if you're stumped at where to begin, that's why you have a whole church right here with you. Pastor, what are some books that I can lead my, my son to read? He's asking me these questions. My daughter. Oh, if, if I had more time, I could share with you the testimonies of families who had come and said, I'm struggling, Pastor, with this, with my, with my teenager. And now they say that they're this, and they believe in that, and they believe in that. I go, hmm, tell me more. Oh, you know what? It sounds like they just need you to be able to sit down and answer some of those questions. Maybe we could come in and have a little pastoral counseling meeting and let them start asking those important questions so that they can be reaffirmed that they don't have to throw out a faith in Jesus Christ. They don't have to throw out everything that the good book teaches us just because somebody said so. I don't know if y'all are hearing me, hearing me today. We need to be there for our children spiritually. So we're spiritually present. Spiritually present. Same goes. Do your children own a Bible? If not, buy them a Bible. Put their name on it. Order it. Spend the 50, 60 bucks getting them a nice Bible with their name on that. That they'll never be able to negate. A beautiful gift that could change their life. Do we spend time in prayer with our children, especially when they're going through difficult times? Do we sit down with them and just pray and hold their hand when they're crying because a friend at school told them that they're not gonna be their friend anymore. They're, they're sending a whole bunch of rumors on, on this social media and Instagram and blah, blah, blah. We need to be there. We need to, to teach them to pray. What did the disciples say when they came to Jesus? They said, Rabbi, teacher, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Do your children pray for dinner? Do they pray for breakfast? Do they pray for lunch? And are we bringing them along and teaching them more than just a, a, a rote prayer? We need to teach them more than our Father who art in heaven. That's good. Teach them that prayer as well. We need to teach them also how to pray by showing them, allowing them to stumble in on you with the doors closed and say, they go, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, dad, sorry, mom. And you're on your knees praying. And then we're living it out after that. We're not praying on our knees and then we're living like hell 10 minutes later. We're being spiritually present creating times of fellowship with them. One of the things that I'll never forget is the way my mom and dad always took me and my brothers and all my cousins for vacation every year. We just go and get away. Well, dad, who's going to take care of the church? Don't worry, we got a lot of great leaders, a lot of other pastors 
that are also gifted and anointed by God to preach and teach and to lead this great body, we're going to go have some vacation. When we would be on vacation, whether it was a, a Sunday, we would go and find a church and plug in when we're on vacation. If we were off at the river and we couldn't make it, we would open up our Bibles right there. We would sing songs and Pops would give us a devotion. And we would sing together as a family. Oh, one of the greatest choirs I ever heard is our Canales family. We need to sing a song soon, huh? The Canales family choir. Here we go. Times of fellowship. We also have to provide spiritual direction for our children. That's why we bring them to church. And don't give them no excuses. Oh, they're tired? Wake them up. Your teenager, oh, he's growing good. Wake him up. He can go back to bed after he comes to church. Oh, he had a long day. Great. Bring him to church. I tell you what my single leg baseball coach told me when I stood him up. We were supposed to go to Gettysburg. I was in single leg with the Houston Astros. And I, I stood him up and didn't wake up that morning. We had a late night, late game. We were taking the bus to the game. He said, Josh, where were you? We are supposed to go to Gettysburg together. We're both history buffs. I said, Coach, man, I was so tired. I, I needed to sleep. He said, sleep when you're dead. Get those teenagers up. Get them in here to church. Vacation Bible School's coming up. It's a great way to jumpstart everything. But it doesn't stop at Vacation Bible School. You have to provide the spiritual direction for your teenagers. Coming to church on Wednesday nights and being a part of the youth group and Royal Rangers and Missionettes. Don't give me all this, well, their bedtime is, no, no, no. Waking up a little bit tired on Thursday morning will never do a child any harm. I promise. I promise it won't. I promise you are robbing your children of, of what they need to be receiving by receiving from other people who are going to be underlining what you're already teaching them at home. They need to grow up in God's house. They need to be church rats. If they're going to choose to not serve Jesus and not walk with Jesus one day when they're grown, guess what? They're going to have to go kicking and screaming. They're going to go have to go and tear and rip Jesus out of their hearts and throw it there and say, I don't want anything to do with that. They're going to have to do everything in their power because we know we as parents are going to do everything in our power to raise them in God's ways and in God's house and in God's word. Amen. Somebody say amen. Man, I could go off. I could go on, but I can't. Jesus would tell the disciples, come on, we need to break away from the multitude. Let's go up to the mountain. The Bible says Jesus was intentional, and he would have retreats with his, his 12, his disciples. And he would say, so what's going on in your guys' hearts? What's going on in your lives? Well, master. And then they would talk, and Jesus would look them in the eyes, and he would speak and teach them. Other times, Jesus would go up and break away to the edge of the water just with his disciples only, nobody else. That was his family. Did you know that? that was his, those were his children. They were his disciples, just like your children are your first disciples. And Jesus would sit down, and then they would sit and say, Master, going to be at your right hand in heaven? He's like, ah, we don't need to worry about those kind of things. The Father's already got all that worked out. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. How many of us have little dichos, little sayings, little proverbs that we teach our children? Well, those will never be taught unless we open our mouths. And we'll never be able to open our mouths and reach our children unless we take the time to sit down with our children. God wants us to be present physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Just as Jesus was intentional about sitting with his disciples, asking those kinds of questions to Peter. Peter, do you love me? God, Jesus wanted to see where his heart was. 